There's a ground unshaken by the fiercest of storms. High above every tempest that roars. There's a word unbroken by the enemy's lies, speaking love. Casting all things aside, Jesus' foundation, my fortress never failing. Jesus, rock of ages, my foundation always. There's a call. Hey, good morning, everybody. Things are just feeling a lot better today in the country, aren't they? We'll have more to say about that in a little bit. But um, we want to uh, just give you a few announcements as we get started here today, uh, our worship service. Uh, first of all, our new Sunday school quarter uh, starts next week. So when you come in the building, those classes we've been telling you about, they'll be on boards out uh, front at the side and the back. So you can see where those rooms are. You mean and attend whichever class that you choose. Uh, and um, we also want to uh, let you know that uh, our Vacation Bible School is coming up. So uh, your friends and neighbors, even your kids in your, in your area, uh, you know, your grandchildren, whoever you know, uh, be a great week for them to uh, be able to come out and to just have a great time. We go all out for Vacation Bible School every year. Uh, I am pleased to say that uh, right now we have all of the teachers uh, and helpers that we need. Um, however, we still would have room for you if you would like to be involved. So if you would see uh, Lindsay Erb, uh, you want to contact, wait, she's not. 
herb anymore, is she? She's so jacked now. I can't ever, oh, this is the curse of being a youth pastor all those years. So Lindsay Sobjack, please see her, uh, and um, she will be able to, uh, to hook you up with uh, getting you involved in some way, uh, shape, or form. Uh, just a reminder to you, though, that if you are uh, going to help with Vacation Bible School, you need to have those child clearances. That is uh, uh, by law. So uh, just keep that in mind. I mean, don't show up and say, hey, I just want to help this week, and you don't have your clearances. Not going to work. Okay? You mean you can't do that. Um, also, we uh, have our baptism plan for July uh, 24th. That's just after VBS. Uh, so if you have not undergone believer's baptism, uh, there are two ordinances that Jesus you know, gave to the church. One is communion, the other is baptism. He commanded all believers uh, to follow the Lord in obedience uh, after salvation in making a public confession of your faith in Christ. Uh, we'll put up our little pool, you mean, inside here. It's a great uh, morning of rejoicing. Uh, you mean, all of your church family love to hear the stories of your conversion. Uh, so if you've never, uh, you know, been obedient to the Lord in that, um, we would love to baptize you. Please see me, one of the pastors, one of the elders or deacons, and we'll be able to uh, get you signed up uh, for baptism there on the 24th. Also, we want to uh, let you know that we have scheduled the little save-a-date, uh, you know, thing here, uh, uh, our church picnic and promotion Sunday. Uh, that is going to be uh, on uh, August 28th. Uh, now, the church picnic will be held down at the pool, so you'll be able to go swimming. We'll have lots of games down there, some food uh, going to happen. It'll be right after our morning service. We'll sort of, you know, truck ourselves down there around 1230, something like that. I mean, we'll start, start to uh, get that food going, and uh, you'll be able to use the pool and all that. Just have a good time, have different games. It'll be a great uh, you know, afternoon of fellowship, you mean, in our church picnic. And that same Sunday, you mean, the kids will, you mean, have their promotion up here uh, during the morning service. That's the day in which they move on uh, to the next grade or into youth group, uh, you mean, there at the end of the summer. Uh, remember also, you mean, that those kids had a packet of memory verses that they're going to say, and there's awards given out to them. Uh, so if the kids still have some verses they still need to say in that program, make sure you talk with their teachers and uh, uh, get them lined up. We do want to be able to recognize them for their achievements. So uh, just uh, a word about that for Promotion Sunday. Uh, and then also, there will be a farmer's market, uh, you know, back there today. Um, and I do just want to, uh, to say a word about that. Um, for a long time now, you I mean, there has been, you I mean, a couple, you I mean, in the church that wish to remain anonymous, uh, that spend a lot of time, you I mean, and energy going and picking up, you I mean, this food and uh, using it, uh, both for Brian Bible Church. Some of it also goes to Project Purpose to, to uh, help with uh, people around the community, especially down in the Rolling Hills, you I mean, area that... Uh, need lunches and healthy food and things like that. Um, and uh, our congregation has also been benefiting, you know, from that. Uh, and although these people would never, you know, want any recognition, uh, you know, I would like just to recognize them and just to have a nice round of applause for them this morning for their ministry to us. I've been enjoying that. Uh, so thank you for those that are picking that up and bringing that to us at great expense, uh, you mean, and uh, a lot of uh, sacrifice there for them to do that. Uh, also, and this is why my wife was staring daggers at me a minute ago. She's back on the project projection software. We do have the junior high mission trip. Uh, the details of that, I mean, the kids will be leaving uh, July 4th through the 8th. That's coming up, you know, real soon. Uh, and uh, so make sure that if you have a kid that's in youth group or somebody that would be interested, uh, that you uh, have them sign up I mean, for that trip. Uh, I mean, up in youth room, they can see Caleb or Mercedes, uh, I mean, for that trip. It's a good one. And also pray for those young people, I mean, as they go away on that trip. It's a very uh, great time for them to learn how to serve. Uh, and to learn how to, uh, to love, you mean, the Lord, you mean, a little bit even more and grow in their faith. Uh, and then our final, you mean, announcement today is it's a little guess who. So who do you think this is right here? I guess it's a little obvious, isn't it? Oh, there we go, folks. I mean, it's a face only a mother could love, right? I mean, and uh, we do want to uh, say happy birthday to uh, Pastor Nick. <laughs> And uh, nice hat, buddy. Uh, but in all seriousness, you know, Nick, we love you very deeply. And, uh, I mean, I am so glad that you are a worship pastor. You do a wonderful job with the music. You prepare our hearts to enter the presence of God. And I have no doubt that you'll do so again this morning. Love you, buddy. Thank you. Love you, too, Jeff. Love all of you. I really appreciate it that uh, you guys <laughs> basically have entrusted me with my entire adult life here. I was still a kid when I came, so... Uh, Thank you for being patient with me all these time. All this time, I'm going to uh, start off with a word of prayer, as we do. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. You've only been good to us, even when we were going through trials. It was for our refining. 
We thank you for this uh, historic landmark in history that after 50 years of prayers and supplication and pain, that millions of innocent lives will get to see light because of your great love and your graciousness to us. And through it, we've had to learn to trust in you. What would life be if, it, if it, everything was easy and simple? Well, we wouldn't have to trust in you. We'd forget about you. Instead, it, you use the hard things to turn our minds to a God who can change it all and save us from it all. So as we give you thanks today, our hearts are focused on your goodness and that we would be nothing without you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as I read from Luke chapter 17. Our, uh, our service is going to be ordered a little bit differently today. As you'll be able to see that it's going to be focused a lot on giving thanks and praise through the, through the scripture and through the message. So we only have one song here to sing at the beginning. But that means we're going to be giving a lot of thanks later. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? No, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So we're going to pick up the slack from those nine ungrateful lepers. Maybe they just forgot. No, no, no. Well, let's, let's be fair to them. But we're going to give God the glory with just this one song before the message as Dwayne leads us.
Father, you've done great things, good things for us, and you were always good, and your love endures forever. We praise you for that, and thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you say hi to somebody on your way down? morning. It's been a very, very eventful week uh, for our nation. And uh, of course, unless you live in a cave or a boyer town like I do, you might have missed it. But uh, uh, we thought that to, to start off this morning, uh, that we would, uh, in, in light of what has happened with the Supreme Court and the overturning and of this uh, made-up constitutional right that uh, earlier, an earlier court had found for the right to murder children uh, has been overturned. And, uh, well, yes, it is, an over, it is something to thank the Lord about. There's a lot of work to be done. But in uh, light of that, we thought that we would give a few moments to Wendy Burpee, who is not only a member here at Bream, but she's also the uh, director of the Women's Health Clinic uh, here in Pottstown. Where are you at, Wendy? There you are. Come, 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 come. That's the, mo that's the most bashful I've ever seen her. Wendy's going to come and share for a few moments. Uh, I don't know. She wouldn't tell me what she was going to say. So come and say whatever you're going to say. I'm going to stick close. If you get out of hand, I'm going to shove you out of the way. Well, um, first of all, I just want to thank Berean. Um, this is the first time that I am here as a, as a member. And that is a really um, big blessing for my husband and myself. We're very proud to be members here now. Some of you may not know that Pastor Jace was the first pastor that I met in this community when I took the job, so you can imagine what that was like for me. <laughs> Actually, he was very supportive and very caring, and um, then shortly after that, I met Nick and his wife, Stephanie, who have been um, staunch supporters. If you come to the Concerts for Life, you know that, and have, um, you know, just come around the center, and me personally as a new director who knew absolutely nothing about the job. Um, so Roe v. Wade being overturned, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that people have been praying for for 50 years. Um, Roe v. Wade um, passed when I was born, the year I was born. Um, and so people have been praying for this for a really, really long time. And, um, you know, what does it mean for Pennsylvania? Well, not a whole lot. <laughs> and uh, although we are happy and we are really um, excited about um, it being overturned on the federal level, for Pennsylvania, we still will continue to murder the unborn up to 24 weeks, which is four weeks past the age of medical liability, so, or medical viability. So, um, you know, not a whole lot is going to change for our state, unfortunately. Um, and so I, you know, I was at the beach when I got the news, and I was so thrilled and so grateful to God, but the work is not over. The work is not over, and um, unfortunately, because our state um, has the governor that we have, we will continue to provide abortion to these women, and what's happening, if you, if you get to work in the, the world that I'm in, uh, there's three states, right, Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, and we will now become the trifecta of abortion destinations. And many, many um, organizations, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods just announced, Costco, Citibank, uh, many big companies are announcing that they will now fly their employees from the states that you cannot abort in to our states 
and you'll be put up in a hotel, and your food will be provided to get your abortion. So, you know, that's a sad state of affairs, that Pennsylvania will be an abortion destination state. So we really need to fight hard. Um, the work is really just going to get geared up for us. There will be uh, pop-up abortion clinics coming in Pennsylvania. There's going to be um, a lot of work that needs to be done here. Now, if we can get a new governor into office, things will change drastically. Um, but, you know, I was reading last night, you know, on the news, obviously, constantly. My husband just enjoys me freaking out in front of the news every morning when they're talking about all these things. And um, there's, there's about 25 of us that are on uh, an email chain, and we, we email each other every day. Are you all right? Is everybody all right? Did anyone get hit? I am not afraid to work in the job that I, that I am in because God put me there. So I know that he has me, and come what may, I will stay and protect the unborn. I owe that to God for redeeming my life, and I owe that to God because three of my children are with him that should be here. And so you can't frighten me easily, but I'm going to tell you that, you know, our, our groups are talking to each other, you know, Kutztown protesters, Norristown protesters, Penn State protesters. The Hope Center in Philadelphia got hit. All their windows were smashed out. And the messages are being left on the buildings. Until abortion is again safe and legal, you are not safe. That's what they're saying to us. But they forget who my God is. And he will protect us. And he will make us understand what we need to do in this ever-changing culture of darkness um, and, and we will keep fighting. We will keep fighting because we will always continue to stand for life. We're going to pray and stand beside those folks on the front lines, right? And be, uh, by the way, we're on the front lines as well. And so... Uh, We'll see how these things shake out. I'm not going to address it anymore in my message uh, this morning. If you want to hear more on it, I'm sure I will address some of it in a message uh, next Sunday morning for Independence Day. And it's going to be entitled something like, Why is America Failing? Or Why is America Flailing? Or Is She Failing or Flailing? Uh, that may be a little bit too much for me to keep straight, but uh, we'll address that next time. For now, uh, we're going to turn to our study in the book of Luke, and we're back in the 17th chapter, and Nick read for us verses 11 to 19. And uh, it was an eventful week for a nation. It was an eventful week for me. As uh, you know, my family was in South Carolina on vacation, and I told you I was on vacation here, but I got a lot of things done. Uh, while they were away, and one of them was while they were away, my bifocals broke. You may not see it from there, but I got a big hole in them, one right here. And so I called the eye doctor and said, I need a new pair of bifocals. And uh, uh, she had a very good nurse who talked me into uh, coming in and getting an eye exam. I know you are all very proud of me. I hadn't been to the doctor for years and years. I haven't been to the eye doctor. Now I've been to both in the last uh, couple weeks. And uh, they told me my eyes are healthy. Uh, I can't see a thing, but the eyes themselves are healthy. And uh, so I went in and had my eye exam, and then she said, look, why don't you come out and, and pick out a new frame for your bifocals that I'm going to get made up for you. And so we walk out into the room there, and there's a room. You know how they have a room, and I say it's nothing but glass frames from, like, walls of them. And uh, uh, I noticed a fella out there uh, when we went out, and the doctor said, Look, with your insurance, you can have anything on this wall that's free. And over here, these are a different. I said, I'll take that pair right there. I'm telling you, it was less than 10 seconds. And uh, the man turned around who was there uh, looking at glasses, and he said, how did you do that? He said, I said, how did you do what? He said, how did you pick a pair of glasses so quickly? I said, well, I didn't have any woman with me. And... Uh, <laughs> 
The, the eye doctor thought that was funny because she was a woman, uh, or at least am I allowed to say that? Is that the preferred pronoun? I didn't ask her. Uh, but I, and, I, and I said to the fellow, he said, I, he said I, 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 I just can't believe that. He said, this is my second time here. He said, I spent 45 minutes the other day looking for a pair, and now I'm back again. I said, listen, sir. I said, I, I, I said look, the, the problem with this is, I said, you're a good-looking man. And I said, so it's very important what your glass are. But he said, look at me. I said, a pair of glasses isn't going to affect me one way or the other. He said, I really thank you for saying that. I'm like, which part? He said, well, you have inspired me. And he grabbed the pair off and went out and left too. But at least he said thank you to me, right? It's important that we get thanked, even if it's backhanded at times. And here in Scripture, and Nick, I know, has a lot of music set to that, and we're to be a thankful people. But I just want to go through this passage, which I find to be so very interesting. Of course, all of them are. But he first he comes with this request. It says, and on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, this recalls, or I want to bring up the, uh, some kind of background in the sense that, remember, Jesus is now in the last few months of his ministry. He has been for some time. Since chapter 9, it said he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. Sometimes we think, you know, this thing is all spread out and we got everything. You got all of this here packed into these last months. He says it again in chapter 13, verse 22. Jesus isn't coming anymore. He's going. He's going to Jerusalem. He's now in the last few months of his three-year ministry before he will enter Jerusalem. He will enter Jerusalem at the Passover and he will become the true Passover lamb who will be sacrificed for once for all of time. He will be sacrificed for all of mankind one time to pay for our sins. But it's not a direct route. And so he's been making his way there. And here we find him moving along the frontiers between the Jews and the Samaritans. So he's, in effect, has Jews on one side of him, Gentiles on the other side of him, and he's going toward Jerusalem to bless them all. And he enters into this village that we're not even told the name of. And I guess that's because the place isn't important, it's the miracle that is. And as he's going in, he sees this mob of lepers, a herd of lepers, if you will, ten of them who are standing off to the side. Now, these men knew of the fame of Jesus. They had to have, because they were waiting on him, and they're crying out to them. And they have leprosy. And uh, I think when we dealt with leprosy before, I had pictures up there of it. Jeff did. I think I did, too, uh, of what many think today is today's Hansen's disease. But in the Bible, it included a lot more of that anything from a lot of skin blemishes to the very worst uh, of uh, the leprosy, which today is called Hansen's disease. You know, I could have put that picture up there and said, ooh, that's gross. It's, you know, the, that picture of the disfigurement that goes with it. Uh, with uh, leprosy, there was a dis there's this destruction of the nerves, and, and especially the peripheral nerves that result in neuropathy uh, throughout uh, your uh, extremities. And uh, because of the uh, when you contract that kind of leprosy, you can't feel anything, so you're prone to cuts that fester, and you can't feel them, burns, anything like that. And it eventually destroys your toes, your fingers, uh, and uh, all of your external limbs, you know, uh, and uh, the people are very greatly uh, disfigured. If you remember back in our study in this, of course, they were considered to be unclean, they were the untouchables of the society. They were pariahs. You talk about maintaining a six-foot distance, they had to maintain a lot more than six feet. 
And they were the kind of people, if you saw coming down the street, you went to the other side of the street. And they were supposed to announce their presence by walking about and yelling out as they went, unvaxxed, unvaxxed, unvaxxed. Oh, no, that's something, all right, that's something different. <laughs> Sorry. It's unclean, 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 warning the people. They were miserable and they were lonely. They were the deplorables of the day. They were quarantined. By the way, even back in those societies, they knew you didn't quarantine the healthy, you quarantined the sick. But they would have lived a very miserable and lonely life. Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46 speak to that. It says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean, unclean. And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is, uh, he is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. He's cut off societally. And they were, of course, set aside. I want you to understand that in the Bible when it talks about leprosy, especially in the Old Testament there, it's generally associated with leprosy was a type of sin, an incurable sin. Sin for which people could do nothing about. Even though in the book uh, of uh, Leviticus, there are two chapters devoted to uh, dealing with leprosy and all of its forms. Actually, it goes into three chapters. What to do if someone uh, supposedly was healed from it. But because of the uh, type of situation that leprosy presented, the Jewish authorities and the Jewish theologians had come to the conclusion that leprosy was incurable except by one means, by a healing miracle of the Messiah. Do you remember that, some of you with us in the beginning of our study here? That this was a miracle. To heal a person of leprosy was something that only the uh, Messiah could do. There was a lot of work done on this by Arnold uh, Fruchtenbaum. Uh, who's, it's a great name. He's a great writer, a, a Jewish believer. He has an interesting note stating that the priests kept close records of those who were declared lepers in Jewish society, and they taught that only the Messiah could heal a leper. In his article entitled The Three Messianic Miracles, he wrote, sometime prior to the coming of Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus, the ancient rabbis separated miracles into two categories. First were those miracles anyone would be able to perform if they were empowered by the Spirit of God to do so. The second category of miracles were called messianic miracles, which were miracles only the Messiah would be able to perform. Yeshua did miracles in both categories, general miracles and also messianic miracles. So because of the rabbinic teaching that certain miracles would be reserved only for the Messiah to do, Whenever he performed a messianic miracle, it created a different type of reaction than, he re than when he performed other types of miracles. Yeah, I guess it did. Because remember, they hated Jesus. And here Jesus was doing miracles. They said, only the Messiah can do these miracles. The first messianic miracle was the healing of a leper. From the time of the Mosaic law was completed, there was no record of any Jew who had been healed of leprosy. Now he says, while Miriam was healed of leprosy, this was before the completion of the law, and Naaman was healed of leprosy, but he was a Syrian Gentile, not a Jew. But from the time of the Mosaic law was given and was completed, there was never a case of any Jew being healed of leprosy. Leprosy was the one disease that was left out of rabbinic cures. There was no cure for leprosy whatsoever. Now he then goes on to say, yet Leviticus 13 and 14 give the Levitical priesthood detailed instructions as to what they were to do in case a leper, leper was healed. On the day that a leper approached the priesthood and said, I was a leper, but now I have been healed, the priesthood was to give an initial offering of two birds. And for the next seven days, they were to investigate intensively the situation to determine three things. First, was the person really a leper to begin with? Second, if he was a real leper, was he really cured of his leprosy? And third, if he was truly, truly cured of his leprosy, 
what were the circumstances of the healing. If after seven days of investigation, they were firmly convinced that the man had been a leper, that he had been healed, and that the circumstances were proper, then on the eighth day, there would be a lengthy series of offerings. Altogether, four different ones. First, there was a trespass offering. Second, a sin offering. Third, a burnt offering. And fourth, a meal offering. Then came the application of the blood of the trespass offering upon the healed leper, followed by the application of the blood of the sin offering upon the healed leper. The ceremony would then end with the anointing of oil upon the healed leper. Now, there's 10 messages in that alone. Although the priesthood had these detailed instructions as to how they were to respond in the case of a healed leper, they never had the opportunity to put these instructions into effect because from the time of the Mosaic law, no Jew was ever healed of leprosy. As a result, it was taught by the, rabbi, yeah, the, rabbi, the rabbis that only Messiah would be able to heal a Jewish leper. So Yeshua sent these 10 lepers directly to the very priesthood that under the leadership of Caiaphas had just decreed a sentence of death against him. This meant that instead of one messianic miracle, there were now 10 at one time. 10 times over, Caiaphas and his priesthood had to spend seven days investigating the whole situation. 10 times over, they had to decree that all 10 of these lepers had been cleansed and healed of their leprosy. Ten times over, they had to decree that Jesus had performed the miracle. It is really humorous, isn't it? Do you think God doesn't have a sense of humor? Yeshua had chosen to send the leadership of Israel ten healed lepers right after they decreed his rejection by sentencing him to death. His Messiahship was proclaimed not merely by the mouth of two or three witnesses, but by the mouth of ten witnesses. And again, he proved to the leadership that they had no basis, no ground for the rejection of his messianic claims. That's important stuff, isn't it? That's stuff unless you, could, unless you understand and study uh, Hebrew culture and the law. Uh, we cut ourselves off from the Old Testament. This is what brings the light, the wonderful things that Jesus has done. And so here's this man, and uh, they're there, and they're without hope. The religion can give them no hope, and Jesus comes, and they've heard great things about him, and they begin to yell at the top of their lungs. And by the way, leprosy also affects the vocal cords, so that many times people lose most of their voice, they become very deep, and they would have been saying, Joshua, Joshua. Screaming at the top of their lungs. Cries of desperation. Croaking out their plea. But they recognize the power of Jesus. They call him master, chief, commander. Have mercy on us. And so they recognized his power, and he was far above them, and he was a master, yet they saw him as approachable. Now, they didn't come up and touch him, but they cried out to him, hoping that he would have mercy on them. Oh, that we, like those lepers, would recognize this morning that our God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a merciful God. Recognize that the lesions and scales of our leprosy, of our sin, because as horrible as leprosy is, it's just a pale picture of what sin does to all of us. They cried out, have mercy. And look at the response of Jesus in verse 14, and when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. The master, the commander, he saw them. You know, you might think he said, did Jesus heard them? No, he more than heard them. He saw them. He looked into their need. To the eyes of society, that's all it said. They were great sinners. 
Look at them. He must have done something to deserve this. They're repulsive. They were to be avoided. They're not worth anything. As a matter of fact, they were unnoticeable to most. They just said, yeah, now just forget those guys over there. They, better, they should stay outside the town. They met him outside the town. Why? Because, you know, they don't belong where good folk belong. But Jesus saw them. In the eyes of Jesus, they were objects of love and compassion. I was reading this, what you know, Spurgeon uh, had, had uh, said about it. And uh, he, he, he said, you know, this reminded him of when the king would travel about England and they had leprosy, was still very prominent in the times of Spurgeon. And he had made a command. He said, listen, he said, when I travel through the town, I don't want to see lepers out there along the roadside. He said, I don't want them pulling on my, my compassion, he said. Keep them shut away. But we've grown so much beyond that, haven't we? Yeah, right. We're all about the homeless until it's time for the Olympics or something. I say, you know, we need, to, we need to get rid of the homeless. We need to hide them away. Those undesirable people, they don't need to be seen. But the eyes of Jesus, he sees them as objects of love and compassion. And it's the same with you and I. It's the same with all people. He sees us long before we see him. Pre-salvation and post-salvation. You do have a Savior that loves you. There's a Savior for the world. There's a Savior for the United States of America who loves sinners. All their sin costs them a great price. But he loves sinners. Sinners, he has compassion upon them if they will but come to him. We have a Savior who's ever ready to see and hear and come to our aid with goodness and power and mercy. And so when they cry out to him, he says, go and show yourself to the priests. It's an heiress command. We're always talking about do something over and over and continuously. He says, no, go. Go now. Do it right away. You got to go to the priests, the health inspectors. They're community health inspectors. They need to inspect you. This is just note here once again that Jesus keeps the law, doesn't he? Jesus didn't come to destroy the law and cut us off from the Old Testament. He said, I've come to fulfill it. And he meticulously fulfills the law all the time. Don't believe me? Go back and read Leviticus 13 and 14. So he does that to keep the law and also, as we just read, to be a testimony to the religious leaders. Religious leaders get to see a miracle ten times over. To testify to who Christ is. After all that they had done against him, after all the things that they have done to undo everything that Jesus was doing, to the point where they are now saying he must die, he is yet reaching out to them. You know what's amazing here in these ten lepers? They had some faith, didn't they? It doesn't say that they looked down and said, oh, he healed them. It says, as they were going, that's an important verb, isn't it? As they were going, they were healed. Obedience brings blessing, doesn't it? See, I, I can see myself being like, you know, uh, raised in that, being forlorn, being lonely, being cut off. The ten of us there, and Jesus says, just go and show yourself to the priest. And saying, like, the guy's blowing us off. The guy can't help us. The guy's sending us, uh, you know, he's sending us down the road just to get us out of his hair. But I think even in his command, go and show yourselves to the priest, there's a tacit promise there, isn't there? If you're looking for one, go and show yourselves to the priest kind of means like, and when you get there, they're going to pronounce you clean. They obeyed. And at least they had the faith that he could heal. Because it happens 
on their way. John MacArthur had a, a great uh, comment on this, and let me see uh, what I'm looking for here. Um, they went their way. And they were looking for healing. Not the one I'm looking for. Not the one I'm looking for. Here's the one I'm looking for. MacArthur says, do they have faith? Sure they have faith. They have a meager, basic faith in a healer. They have faith in the power and compassion of Jesus. Were they cleansed because they believed? Well, it was a meager faith, and Jesus asked them to demonstrate that meager faith. They were basically healed because he chose to heal them. But he did involve their faith in it. There were times when Jesus healed people because they believed. There were many times when he healed people who didn't believe. In fact, there were times when he raised people from the dead. And dead people can't believe, right? So there were times when faith played a role in healings and times when it did not. But in this case, he asked them to exhibit enough faith to do what he said. So you need to keep them things straight. You'll get caught up in all the faith healers of the day. But here he says, you know, go. And they went, and while they went, they got healed. They were cleansed, it says. Imagine walking down that road with those 10 men. Wouldn't you like to have been there with them? First of all, we wonder, we said, no, they're dirty. They're unclean. These guys were walking, and maybe the one guy said to the other, hey. Um, and the other guy said, yeah, I'm feeling like, ah. And he started to look. And, and we're not talking, you know, these people many times, they, they would have been like down to the nubs. A lot of times their noses would be, and suddenly things were, and they had flesh like a baby's. And they were healed. And it says that they were cauterized in the Greek. The word means pure, clean, without spot or stain. The same word that's used in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cauterize us. To cleanse us from all of our sin. To make us pure, spiritually speaking. What an amazing thing, right? Can you imagine what those men felt? The amazement that came on me. Look, man, I'm good looking again. With glasses, without glasses, I'm good looking. Jesus has made me whole. The amazing thing that is only one turn back, isn't it? You think they all said, oh, no, I know I got to go to the temple, but I've got to go see the man who did this to me. A healing is one thing, but I need the healer. See, there's where the return comes in verses 15 to 19. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Boy, what a U turn there, huh? I don't care what the signs along the road says. It's time to make a U-turn when something like that happens. They were all healed. But one was impacted not as much by his healing as he was by the healer. For him, the healing was secondary to the healer. For nine of them, they kept going their way. And I'm sure they were amazed at their healing. But this one, he wanted more than a physical healing. He wanted the healer. He wasn't content with the physical gain alone. He wanted a relationship. And it says he started to praise God with a loud voice. He got all emotional about it. Oh, my goodness, he mustn't have been a Baptist. He mustn't have been a fundamental Bible church person. Because we all don't get very emotional about things. He glorified God with a, with a loud voice. Remember that because we're going to be glorifying God in a couple minutes here. It's not wrong to get emotional about the Lord, is it? Now, if you base everything on emotion, that's a problem. 
But boy, some of us let the pendulum swing too far the other way. This man was cleansed of leprosy. And he said, that's worth rejoicing over. What about you? You know Christ is your Savior this morning? You've been cleansed of your sin. Is that something to get emotional about? Oh, man. That's greater than the healing of leprosy is to be delivered from the death and the bondage of sin. But only one turned back. Giving thanks, it says. Present, active, indicative. That means he was giving thanks over and over. He wouldn't stop. It was ongoing. There it is, continuous. He's just praising God and headed back. And I'll bet you he wasn't walking. I'll bet he was running. Because I bet he couldn't even run with his toes all chewed up before. But I bet he was running about five feet off the ground. And jumping and skipping like a little girl. And he said, I don't care how I look. I don't care if they consider me a fool. I have got to see the healer. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, verse 16 says, giving him thanks. And there's this little add-on. Now, he was a Samaritan. He loved the way the Scripture puts a lot of those things. He fell at his feet in humility. And he was worshiping him. That's what he's doing here. He's worshiping him. And I want you to notice something. Jesus didn't stop him, did he? And say, no, don't, 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 don't do that. No, away with this nonsense that Jesus was not God in the flesh. Away with this nonsense that Jesus didn't recognize or realize who he was. He accepted worship, which he knew that only God could accept. And he accepted it because he was God in the flesh. And he's worshiping, and it's coming from an unexpected source. And he was a Samaritan. Out of these ten, most very most likely the only one. The other nine were most likely Jewish. You know before, if you've sat here, that you know the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Why? Because the Samaritans were a mixed race people. They were descendants of Jews, of the northern tribes of Jews. They, uh, when the uh, they were taken over there. They, they were mixed with Gentile races. And so the pure Jews of Judea, they saw them as polluted by race, and they were polluted in their religion. You see that animosity throughout Jesus' ministry between the Jews and the Samaritans. Let's look at John chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. Now, in verse 9 of John, it's, 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 where John tells us that he says, Now the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And the Samaritans no dealings with the Jews. There was racial animosity there. Terrible racial animosity. You think that's new to mankind? This is the woman at the well, and she's talking to Jesus. She was a Samaritan. And she said, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say, as a Jew, Jesus, you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You know, you're a G Samaritan. You mixed in uh, Judaism with pagan religions and you worship here on Mount Gerizim. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, he says, and it's now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such pe people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. How gracious of Jesus to accept his worship. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile for all intents and purposes. But here it is. He came back. For all intents and purposes, you know, uh, 
they said, oh, you know, you, you need to go to the temple. Well, he was a Gentile. They wouldn't have left him in there to worship. As some have pointed out, it said the nine thought they were going to worship God. Maybe, perhaps, the nine came back and said, well, well we're going to worship God when we get to the temple. But you need to point out, God doesn't dwell in that temple. God hadn't dwelled in that temple for a long time, had he? Ichabod had been written over that temple in Jerusalem. Why? Because the glory of God and the presence of God had departed because of their sin. And so a lot of what was happening in the temple was an apostate form of religion. And that's why Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. You know what was important for this one? He knew where to worship God, at the feet of Jesus. He knew where God really dwelt in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the real temple, the true temple of God. You don't believe me? Look it up in John chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. He recognized that wherever the compassion of God is, that is where God is. Wherever the power of God is, that is where God is. Wherever the grace of God is, that is where God is. God doesn't dwell in a temple. God doesn't dwell in Jerusalem. He dwells in Jesus. And this man knew it. What a wonderful truth that's given to us here. That this man who was so far off, and that people, when you deal with Christ, those who are thought to be the worst by the world and by the standards and the, and the judgment of the world are made the best by Christ. For being judged by the world. And it's not good, is it? You bigots. You homophobes, you religious nuts. Aren't you glad what it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12? Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh were called the uncircumcision. I think just about everybody, all of us here, are Gentiles, Right? And we were cut off. And we were called the uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Not anymore. Like this Samaritan, not anymore. Listen, all ten were made physically well. But only one, we know for sure, was made completely well, outside and inside. Because let me say, well, Pastor, what about the other nine? Were they saved? I don't know. But I know there was a great danger to the other nine, wasn't there? Some people sit and argue about this forever. They were saved. No, they were not saved. I can tell you this guy is saved. I can tell you this guy you're going to see in heaven. The other nine, I don't know about. You know how I know it? Jesus tells me. In verse 15, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, when he saw that he was made 
whole, physically speaking. Aeomai means to heal someone of a disease, a physical healing. When he saw that he was physically healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, he doesn't use the word I am I there. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has sozo. It has saved you. That's a different level, isn't it? You were with them other guys and there was a healing. Now you're here and there's a spiritual saving that goes on. I could go through all the book of Luke and say that, you know, here's the times Luke loses the word sozo. And there are times when sozo doesn't necessarily mean spiritual. But I think the context here gives you clearly that this man was a saved individual. In some t- contexts, sozo can mean something less than inner salvation. But here it is obvious Luke is describing salvation. i just give you a couple real quick where he uses the word sozo. For whoever wishes to, be, to save his life, sozo his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, for he is the one who will sozo it, save it. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to sozo them, to save them. And then they went to another village. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being sozoed? And in Luke 9, verse 19, verse 10, he says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to sozo that which was lost. You think he's just talking about a physical healing there? Do you think you're going to see this man in heaven when you get there if you're saved as well? How about the other nine? I don't know. Can ungratefulness keep you out? No, not if they truly believe. But when it talks about the ten of them, he talks about using the word healing. Here, he talks about that inner thing. You have to be careful. I'm going to finish again with something with John MacArthur because I think he handles this very, very well. MacArthur feels that the other nine that were healed did not not returning was illustrative of the Jews in general, writing that the ungrateful nine illustrate the general attitude of the Jews. The general attitude of the Jews was, we'll take everything you give, Jesus. We'll take all the benefits. We'll take all the miracles. Just don't expect us to worship you as God. The one Samaritan is a picture of the outcast, the remnant, the 10%, like I think I referred to in Isaiah chapter 6 last week, the 10th that will believe. The grateful Samaritan is a picture of the outcasts who believe in Jesus. This was like the Samaritan woman. He says, these are the ones who are the riffraff, the scum, the the thugs, the lowlifes, the prostitutes who surround Jesus, and of whom he said he had come to call the sinners, not the righteous. Everyone heard the message. Everyone enjoyed the benefit of Jesus' power. Everyone basked in the wonder of his teaching and his miracles. But only a few came, only a few fell at his feet, glorified him as God, worshipped him, humbled themselves, and offered him thanks. The majority there were takers, only as a small group gave him worship. The majority were content with fixing their life up, being content with that which was temporal, unconcerned about the external. Only a small group wanted him to change their souls and transform their hearts and lives. You think that's happening today? Many in America will say, I respect Jesus. I love his teachings. I'll go to him. I want a healing from Jesus. I want him to make my life better here and now. But do they know him as their savior? Have they humbled themselves? Have they confessed their sins? Have they fallen at his feet and given their lives over to him? And give him the glory. I fear that there are many people today. Who 
to look at Jesus and say, I'll take what I can get. But I'm keeping my life the way it is because I like it the way it is. Oh, God gave it to me, so yes, I'll thank God for it. We hear people say that all the time. I thank God for my life. I thank God I'm healthy. I thank God that I have children. I thank God for my job. But is it not possible to thank God and still walk away into eternal darkness? I say the answer to that is a resounding yes, because Jesus healed many people physically who never came to him spiritually. I guarantee you of that fact. He went into villages and healed everybody who came. He went everywhere, and some of the writers, and Jeff was sharing that with me, that they, they believe, that say, hey, at the time of Jesus, his disease and sickness became almost unknown. He had healed so many people. Would that they had all come to know him. Would that a lot of Americans who will give thanks to Jesus for something, but deny him their life and deny themselves salvation because they will not let go of their sins. They will not embrace him. They will not see him as their savior. Examine yourself. One of the hallmarks, if you're saved, is are you thankful? Are you really thankful for Jesus? Examine your hearts. Where are you this morning? It's not enough to say, Jesus is a good guy. Man, I want Jesus to give me good things. Man, I thank God for all the blessings I have. Politicians do it all day long, don't they? Does it mean that they have a personal relationship? No. Does it mean that you do? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be a really tr and truly thankful people. Father, help us to live out Psalm 107, to be thankful. As we come from the east and the west and the north and the south, you take us all. If we'll but humble ourselves, confess our sins, repent of our sins, and receive the cleansing and the life everlasting that only the Lord Jesus can give. Then, and only then, are we truly thankful people. Then do we have life everlasting. Then can we glorify you and all that we say and do. And we'll thank you and praise you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Challenge you to look up Psalm 107. Read it. It's a great psalm of thanksgiving that every one of us should practice day in and day out. Nick, are we going to thank the Lord? We are, and we're going to go to another psalm too, because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of good ones about thanksgiving. Right. So I told you we were going to have a Oh, it was Wendy's fault. Okay. Blame it on a woman like he does every week. So, the passage we're going to read together, because instead of me just reading it to you, comes from Psalm 100. Go ahead. Would you stand with me?
Let's say it together.
times are the beginning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son,
Bless the Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life in your presence, in fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws me and my time has gone. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. Last one. This is an invitation song. It invites those of you who have been redeemed, who know Jesus as your Savior, to thank Him for it. But I'm not going to just go out in here and think that everybody has already found that Savior who's healed you from your sin, your leprosy. He promises to cleanse you. You believe in His 
free gift. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, rose again from the dead. You believe into that, you have eternal life. It's a free gift. And that's what we're going to sing about as we close out our service. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to be. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made Now, it's almost like clockwork. I'm, I'm letting you out late. Sorry. I'm not doing anything else. That's not what I'm saying. It's almost like clockwork now whenever we have a great service planned, but Jeff gives me some sort of lame announcement just to break down the mood. Um, please announce today is the last day to submit the completed liability waivers for Good Works Ministry. Alan Weller will be in the back. So there you go for that.
At least it wasn't as bad as uh, tell everybody who won the chili cook-off after uh, we had everybody get saved, you know. Great. That was my favorite one. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness, for your love. And as uh, we go out into the world, we recognize that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and all the rules of darkness, principalities, the enemy himself that would seek to do us harm, to seek to tempt us to go against your will. We live in a world that seems like it's sometimes designed to go against us. Well, the God of this age would have us think so. But we serve a God who is greater than he that is in the world. He is above it, he created it, and he is Lord over all. So would you heal the leprosy of our heart, cleanse us, that we might be living testimony to the world around us that we serve a risen Savior who indeed washes us clean from every stain of sin. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.